Uh, well, welcome. Thank you again for joining us. My name is Bryce. My pronouns are he, him, and I will be guiding everyone through our session this evening. To begin, I'd like to say a few important words. As a treaty person, I'm grateful to be able to live, learn, and work on this land. Western's campus is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapowak, and Chinonkton nations. These lands are connected to the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Today, I'm joined by my co-host Ryan, a number of staff, faculty, and current students from the School of Health Studies, and of course, all of you, welcome. Let's go through a few housekeeping items before we get started. First, this session is being recorded. It will be available on our website in about a week or so. You'll be able to find it on the same page you went to to register for this event, welcome.uwo.ca slash presentations. Next, live closed captioning is enabled. If you'd like to turn it on, you'll find the live transcript button on the bottom bar. Then you can choose show subtitle or view full transcript. Just remember, this is live closed captioning, so we cannot guarantee the accuracy. Next, your video and audio will remain off today, but that doesn't mean we won't be interacting. We will have polls throughout the presentation, and we also want to answer all of your questions. You can submit a question using the Q&A box. You'll find this at the bottom of your screen. You can enter questions now or anytime throughout the presentation. Someone from Western will type an answer to you, and we'll also answer a few questions live at the end of the presentation. One tip about questions, be as specific as possible to get the best answer. So let's get started with a poll right now. If I can have my colleague Ryan launch the poll, we'd love to know where you're joining us from this evening. Wonderful, we've got some folks from right here in London, elsewhere in Ontario, and then some folks joining us from across Canada and all over the world. Wonderful. Uh, we'd also love to know who you're joining us with tonight. Are you flying solo this evening? Maybe you're watching with a parent or guardian, sibling or a friend. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, wherever you're watching us from and whoever you're joining us with, we're very happy you're here to learn more about health studies at Western. Without further ado, Let's check out our schedule for the night. We're going to start with a welcome from Dr. Rachel Forster-Jones, Director of the School of Health Studies. Then Lauren Dodd will walk you through a comprehensive overview of health studies. Things like what the difference is between health sciences and medical science, what programs are offered in health studies and what courses you can take. Next up is a mini lecture with Assistant Professor Dr. Marnie Wedlake on resilience and the creation of well-being. After that, we're going to get to know some current health studies students in a student panel. They will share some of their own experiences here at Western. And finally, we'll all join together at the end to answer some questions live. We hope you'll join us for the entire event, but if you can't, no worries. As I mentioned earlier, there will be a recording available on our website. And don't forget to sign up for our other events. We have lots of other events coming up this spring. If you haven't attended a Next Steps presentation, we highly recommend you do so. It's helpful for everyone to understand what you have to do before coming to Western. We also have a special presentation about residents if you're thinking about living in residence or you just want some more information. And last but certainly not least, a presentation from student experience. If your travel plans permit, we have an in-person event scheduled for May 7th, our spring open house. You'll have an opportunity to tour Western's beautiful campus and learn more about programs, services, and residents. You can sign up on our website, the same place you signed up for this event, welcome.uwo.ca slash presentations. Without further ado, let's get started. I will now invite Dr. Rachel Forrester-Jones, Director of the School of Health Studies, to say a few, few words to welcome you. Thank you very much, Bryce, and good evening, everybody. Uh, wherever you're zooming in from, you're very welcome, as are your parents. And uh, so it's beautiful sunshine here. Um, I'm still in my office, and I'm very happy to be here. And on behalf of all my colleagues in the School of Health Studies, I'd just like to give you a very warm welcome and hope that you enjoy this evening and that you take away um, all the information that you need to make 
an informed decision. And informed decisions is what we're about. Uh, we're about evidence um, and using research evidence to improve the health and well-being of all people and all groups across the world. And that is our mission. So what kind of school are we? Well, we're a group of academics with a variety of, uh, from a variety of disciplines. Uh, we have medics, clinicians, psychologists, anthropologists, uh, sociologists, social policists, uh, lawyers, barristers, um, psychotherapists, uh, people who uh, their main, their main um, background is anatomy. So you can see that there's a range of uh, I think we've even, even got a job with us. So there's a range of um, disciplines. Now, how do we use those? Well, we look at health and healthcare in the round. So we look at not only at um, you know genetics and, and um, biology, but we also look at the personal and social determinants of health. And what do I mean by that? Behavior, diet, location, whether people are living in rural or urban areas. And specifically, how people access healthcare, whether they get equal access to healthcare, if they can even get access to healthcare, and what type of healthcare they are provided with. Is it good quality or is it poor quality? And how does that impact their everyday lives? Um, there are other issues also uh, that we look at. So, for example, socioeconomic group poverty, um, at climate change, the climate impacts. Um, health impacts in relation to indigenous populations um, and uh, in terms of equity and uh, disability, for example, but the whole range, these are really important issues. And notwithstanding the fact um, that we are living in very tricky times. Uh, now, you know, I don't know where, where this pandemic is going, what travel, what road of travel it's taking. I don't know uh, what the impacts will be the long-term impacts. I don't know what the, how those impacts will play out on individuals and groups and communities. But this I do know, that we need people like you, uh, students who have uh, inquiring minds, who are creative, and who are open to critical analysis of healthcare, current healthcare, and current healthcare policy, and who wish to make a difference uh, to uh, individuals, to communities, and to people across the globe. And if you are interested in that, then we will provide you with the tools and the knowledge base in order to go out and make a difference in relation to health and social care and health and well-being. I do know as a social, my background, I'm a professor of social policy and a professor of social exclusion um, in previous roles. My particular research area is uh, intellectual and developmental disability. And I know that uh, politicians and governments across the world are really grappling with health care policy at the moment, and they will be ripping up policies and starting again. And we need people uh, to be in there in the thick of it. Uh, we may not have, our generation may not have made the best uh, use of our knowledge, and, and we really hope that you will be world leaders after you leave um, and after you leave our degree. Alumni we have uh, who are working in all kinds of um, healthcare pro provision, either medics or dentists, but not just that. More, perhaps even more importantly, world uh, policy, um, health analytics. Uh, th there's a range of um, consultancy that, that really countries need. So we need people like you, and uh, we think we, we have a fantastic programme. We know we have a fast, fantastic programme and we know we can really provide you with a, a gold standard education. So I, I, I'm now going to um, hand over uh, to my colleagues uh, to tell you more about it um, and what, what we have to offer. But again, I would love to uh, meet some of you um, when time permits. And thank you very much for joining and, and listening tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. We really appreciate that warm and inspiring welcome. And now we're going to hand it over to Lauren Dodd, who's going to go over uh, a program overview for the School of Health Studies. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much again for joining us. My name is Lauren Dodd, and I'm an academic advisor here in the School of Health Studies at Western. 
as an academic advisor, part of my role is to help you with your course selection, navigate your academics throughout your entire undergraduate degree, um, whether that's including selecting the right module for you and planning for postgraduate programs as well. The academic advising team is here to help you with all of your different academic questions throughout your degree, and we're able to support you throughout that entire process. Part of those uh, different supports that we can offer include many different supports across campus. So one of those starts even before you start in September. Summer academic orientation is a great opportunity to take advantage of where all staff come together in order to help you to make sure that when you come to campus in September, you're ready to thrive. So you've picked the right courses, you're prepared for all of the things um, that you'll be encountering in that first year. During summer academic orientation, we make sure that you've selected the right courses. Um, so before you even step foot on campus, you know, okay, I have the right courses. I'm set up to thrive when I do come on to campus. So that's something that I definitely encourage students to take advantage of. And we're excited for that every year where we get the opportunity to meet all of the students who will be entering the first year. As well, kind of in that first uh, term, it's important that we do a first semester check in. So that's something that we want to do with the students in the School of Health Studies just to make sure that everything's going okay. Maybe remind you about some of these different resources that we have on campus and the academic advising team that were there for you if you do have any questions throughout that first year, but also as you continue on in your degree. So that first year check-in, I do remind students a lot about these different resources, and one of those is the Peer Assisted Learning Centre. So with that, that's a great opportunity for students to actually get one-to-one -one support from peers who have really excelled in courses, and now we're offering a little bit of extra assistance to students um, in various courses, not only in first year, but throughout your entire degree. So I definitely encourage you to mark that one down, but if not, I will always remind students of that at the first year check-in. As well, there's the Leadership and Academic Mentorship Program, which is really cool. It's an opportunity for students to get be paired with an upper year student in their program or faculty and get that little bit of extra support, whether it's um, academic support or just the, the support of the transition. Um, they, they know they've, they're in their upper year, so they know what it's like to transition in their first year and, and they're there for you if you have any questions. And then as well, career coaching. It's never too early to start thinking about what you want to do after your degree. And I'm sure you're already thinking about that. So with career coaching, that's a really great opportunity to meet with our career coaches on campus and actually have somebody help you figure out what it is that you're interested in. What do you see yourself doing in the future? So another great resource that I encourage you uh, to utilize right from year one, uh, but certainly students really appreciate that as they're in their third and fourth year. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are, are wondering, what is the difference between health science and medical science? And I know that uh, a lot of times when students are looking at different universities, things may be different um, programs. So programs might be life science, health science, medical science. What is it that you're looking at? And certainly when you're looking at Western, a lot of students wonder, okay, what is health science and what is medical science and which one is the right one for me? So we definitely want to make sure that you know the difference and that you're prepared for whichever one that it, it is that you are interested in. So when you're looking at um, health science, for example, you're going to be getting the Bachelor of Health Science degree, and that really focuses on the interdisciplinary study of health and wellness in an ever-changing society, in addition to domestic and international health systems. So you're looking at topics such as health, health and aging, health promotion, rehabilitation. Those are some specializations that you can do within the Bachelor of Health Science. If you're looking at general science, you're looking at the Bachelor of Science. This explores more of the diversity of organisms and complex relationships that exist with the different levels of biological organization. So you're talking specializations such as biology, genetics, chemistry, animal behavior. That's more so what you would be getting into with the Bachelor of Science. And then as well, if you're looking at medical sciences, so with the Bachelor of Medical Sciences, that looks more at the molecular, cellular, and systematic organization of the human body and biological systems that it uses to adapt to environmental changes. So you might be looking at something like pharmacology, biochemistry, pathology, more those areas.
So as you can see, there are some vast differences with the programs. And what it takes is just looking at the different programs, the courses that are in those programs to see what it is that you'd be most interested in. So are you more interested in that interdisciplinary study of health and wellness like you would get in health sciences? Or are you more interested in a molecular, cellular um, level? So that gives you a little bit of an idea of a breakdown of the differences. And this chart can also be found on the websites of both medical science and health sciences. So I encourage you to check it out if you do have any further um, questions or information you're trying to research on that to make the best decision for yourself. As you can see from this friendly looking doctor here, um, and I'm sure a question that is on all of your minds is, can I go to medical school if I do a, a Bachelor of Health Science degree? The answer is yes. So there is not one particular degree that uh, leads you to a to medical school. So students can study for the most part, whichever it is that they're interested in. And certainly many students who do the Bachelor of Health Science are interested in, in taking the route to medical school. So the answer to many of your questions is yes, you can apply to medical school if you do a Bachelor of Health Science. Now, what is health sciences? You might be wondering exactly um, what that is, and I know we've talked about that a little bit on the on the last slide there. Um, but when we're looking at health sciences, we're, like I said, we're talking about the interdisciplinary approach to health and wellness. You're looking at things such as um, policy, leadership within health, um, stress, stress, lifespan, aging, health over um, childhood versus um, adulthood, all of those sorts of things. You're looking at well-being of the community, care, uh, health promotion, global health, so health across the entire world and how that differs um, from Canada and across the globe. So a very interdisciplinary approach to health and wellness, um, but a really great opportunity to take a look at rehabilitation and also those social determinants of health and personal determinants of health um, to see health as, as a whole picture. So it's a really great opportunity to study health in a, in a whole approach in, in many different ways that you're able to take a look at that. Now, you definitely want to know what will you study if you are in health sciences. That's really important. And one thing that I always say to students is you want to be interested in what you are studying. And one of the ways to, to really determine that is to take a look at the different courses that you might be studying within the course. So if you were um, going to take health sciences, what are these different courses that I'm going to be taking? Am I interested in those? And a good way to find that out is by actually looking at the course description. So taking a look through some course descriptions and saying, okay, yeah, I can see myself studying that. I'm interested in that. And that'll help you determine if that's somewhere that you can see yourself. So the, within health sciences, um, there are a couple of different degree options, which is a really great way um, to personalize your degree to what it is that you're interested in. So as we mentioned, you get a Bachelor of Health Science degree when you're in the School of Health Studies. And students participate in a common first year of study before applying for admission to a specialization or major prior to your second year. So for example, in your first year, you would be taking the specific health science courses and along with some electives. But then after first year, you would really decide, okay, what is it that I'm interested in pursuing? Is that health sciences, which is our most flexible degree option, our most flexible program option um, within the degree. Health sciences with biology, that's for students who are really interested in pairing um, their health science degree with a lot more biology. So very much towards those biology focused students might really enjoy this type of program. Health and aging, health promotion, and then rehabilitation sciences. So there's a lot of different areas that you can go, and it's a great opportunity to really personalize your degree to what it is that you're interested in most. And that's something that you can really determine throughout your um, courses, or what, it, what is it that I'm interested in pursuing, and which type of program is it that I want within my Bachelor of Health Science degree. As I mentioned, um, there is that common first year. So when you're looking at your first year course selection, as I mentioned, summer academic orientation is a great opportunity to make sure that you have those courses that you need to set yourself up for success. So you want to make sure that you have the first year courses that you need, but then also make those building blocks so that when you go into year two, you have the courses that you need to take some second year courses that you're interested in as well.
So when you're looking at your first year, there are 1.5 health science courses that are required. So there's the personal determinants of health, social determinants of health, and then resilience and well-being. So these courses really give you that framework of courses that you will be taking in your upper year in health sciences um, to help you kind of determine, okay, these are some of the areas that I might be interested in. So it gives you a little bit of a taste of the health science courses. And then as well, students take 1.0 biology. So when you're looking at uh, your first year courses, you would be looking to take two half credit courses in biology in order to make sure that you have the required courses. And then students have the opportunity to take elective courses. So these are courses that you want to take. So maybe there's something that you've taken in high school that you're really interested in and you want to continue pursuing that while you're at university. Or on the other hand, maybe there's something that you haven't had an opportunity to study at high school and you really want to take that while you're at university. This is an opportunity to fit that into your first year courses. And just a note for students who are interested in the health science with biology, you will also need 1.0 chemistry and 1.0 math. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. The math courses can be taken in your second year. They don't need to be taken in first year, um, but it is important to note that if you are interested in health science with biology, there are a few extra requirements that you would want to make sure that you have. And again, we would go over all of this at the summer academic orientation to make sure that you are set up for success for the module um, that you're intending to enter. And certainly when you're in your first year, you might think, oh, okay, you know, I'm going towards the health science with biology. And then after first year, you might change your mind a little bit and that's completely okay. That's why we don't make you um, select your specialization until um, you are going into that second year. So we want to give you that opportunity in first year to figure out what it is that you're interested in. So as I mentioned, it's really important to look at those courses that you would be interested in taking. Um, so taking a look at those course descriptions and seeing what it is that you'd be really interested in. So when you're in your second year, you'd be looking at courses such as health promotion, health issues in aging, health issues in childhood and adolescence, anatomy, and ethics in health. So again, these give you more of that framework so that when you go into those third and fourth year courses, you really have a great basis um, of knowledge uh, going into those courses. And hopefully when you're looking at these courses, the titles of the courses alone um, excite you into what you would be studying in those courses. As well, when you're looking at third year, you'd be looking at health policy, health care law, sexuality, gender and health brief history of drug use, global health promotion. And these are just a few of the options that are available. There's so many different courses and I encourage you to check out the different courses that are available. You can see um, the timetable and on our website, you can check out the different courses that were offered um, in the past year uh, to see some courses that you might be interested in taking while you're at Western to get excited about the course material. And then when you're looking in fourth year, you might you're specializing even, even further in those courses. So gerontology and practice, social media and health, human embryology, health innovation and leadership. And then there's even an opportunity to do an independent study or a practicum. So it's a really great uh, where you actually have that opportunity maybe to get that hands-on experience, research experience when you're in that fourth year. And the best thing about the School of Health Studies at Western is it is home to award-winning professors who are really dedicated to creating that vibrant learning environment and they've won many awards for their teaching excellence so we're really proud to have those professors teaching you um, right from your first year in the school of health studies and when you're looking at university you a lot of students are, are really interested in what are those experiential learning opportunities that I'm going to get if I join the school of health studies if I join western I really want to know what opportunities can I have to get hands on learning, to think outside of the box a little bit, to get outside of that classroom. And there are many opportunities in the School of Health Studies, as well as Western as a whole. One of the, the opportunities that I wanted to highlight highlight was the Aging Globally course. So this is a really great third year course that introduces students to healthcare systems, public health care policies, home care delivery practices, hospitals, long-term care homes and aging and research and community initiatives, 
from Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. So you're really looking at those and comparing them to how things operate here uh, in Canada. So it's a great opportunity to, to look outside of our country and see how things are operating um, in other parts of the world, uh, specifically in these countries. It also includes a 10-day trip through uh, Scandinavia in early May. So it's a really cool opportunity for students to get that outside of the classroom um, learning while um, applying that knowledge and, and really deciding, okay, how does this affect us here? Um, how does this affect uh, people across the globe? And then actually having that opportunity to travel um, as a class is, is such a neat um, opportunity that I hope uh, would, be, would it be exciting to you. And if you did come to Western that you would be able to, to take advantage of that opportunity. We've recently secured um, some funding uh, that really helps students to take advantage of this opportunity. As well, there's community engaged learning courses. So as I was mentioning, that opportunity to get outside of the classroom and gain that hands-on practical experience to really develop those professional skills. And while you're doing that, you're assisting a community partner um, with gaining a fresh new perspective and opportunity to implement the work that is created by you. Um, so you might be working on a specific project that a community partner needed a little bit of help with, and they needed that fresh, um, that fresh lens that students offer. Uh, so it's a great opportunity, not only for you as a student, um, to be able to get that hands-on experience and also networking um, experience, but it's really great for the, the community partner to have that new lens that the student brings forward. An example of this is the environmental health promotion um, course where students were responding to the health needs of an aging population and students have the opportunity to examine global aging and investigate issues unique to specific aging populations. So it's really neat for those students who are interested in areas such as that and, and really fine tuning that um, in a unique way. As well, I mentioned earlier that there's the independent study opportunity. So our fourth year honor students have the opportunity to gain, engage in an independent study course. And this allows students to really explore in more detail um, and research something that they were interested in. So maybe you took a course and you thought, oh, wow, I'm, you know, I'm really interested in that. And maybe there's a professor that you've connected with who is doing research in that area. This independent study opportunity offers you that opportunity to get involved in research um, in a bit different of a way. So it's really neat and a lot of students are very interested in taking advantage of that opportunity when they are in their fourth year. And then as well, there's the practicum courses. So another great way to get that hands-on experience in a practical uh, placement setting. So you might be able to join somewhere such as a long-term care facility, a retirement home, a community organization such as Heart and Stroke Foundation or Participation House, um, in research labs, in a school, in a hospital. There's many different opportunities uh, for students to get involved in that practicum uh, in their fourth year. So I would encourage you, if you are interested in something like that, definitely taking a look at it um, kind of early on and, and finding out the different requirements um, and making sure that you, you do uh, take advantage of something like this when you're in your fourth year, because these are all of the opportunities that really help you determine what is it that I'm interested in doing when I graduate? Is this something that I can see myself doing in the long term? And it's a great opportunity to, to figure that out. And then as well, we have the internships. So uh, following the completion of third year, students have the opportunity to participate in a paid career rate related placement, whether that's for eight, 12 or 16 months. And that's where that you actually get to work in a workplace setting while gaining experience and building a wide range of unique um, skills. So not only are you networking during this internship opportunity, but you're gaining a new perspective. And again, having that opportunity to really realize, okay, what is it that I'm interested in doing? Do I enjoy this? Is this something that I can see myself doing um, in the future or not? And that's okay too. All of these are great learning opportunities to, to see what it is that you are interested in doing. There's so many different supports available to help you with this internship opportunity. And one of those supports, as I had mentioned previously, with career coaching, the Careers and Experience Office helps you with your resume, um, interview preparation, all of those sorts of things to make sure that you are prepared when it comes time to interviewing for those internship opportunities. 
And then you want to know where can I take my degree? That's definitely an important um, part of your degree is finding out, okay, what am I going to do afterwards? Um, so we want to help you throughout um, your degree. So whether that's with academic advising, helping to make sure um, that you're setting yourself up for success with pre prerequisite courses for graduate programs, or you're visiting the careers and experience office for career help, um, we're all here to help you uh, pursue your goals. So a lot of students uh, in the School of Health Studies, they go in many different directions. There's not one specific direction. And that's because we are an interdisciplinary program where students are looking at so many different things and they're looking at health from a, many different lenses and perspectives and looking at many different ways to get involved after their undergraduate degree. So whether look, they're looking at a professional program, maybe you're looking at medical school, dental school, nursing, um, physical or occupational and respiratory therapy, those are all options that many students pursue as well. Audiology and speech language pathology, law, education, chiropractic, there's so many different ways um, that students go and I would always encourage you getting in touch with academic advising if there's something that you're interested in um, when you're in your degree and you're not really sure of the academic requirements for that program, we're always happy to help you um, navigate that. So there's always a new program that students are bringing um, to me that I hadn't heard of before. And it's a really cool opportunity for me to learn about it and, and be able to tell future students about these neat programs that they might be interested in taking. And then while as well, some students are looking more at the research and course-based programs, maybe looking at international, global and public health, bioethics and biomedical engineering, healthcare ethics and law, clinical anatomy, environment and sustainability, psychiatric research, health and rehabilitation sciences. So there's so many different things that students are looking at and there's not one set path and hopefully kind of throughout the presentation I've been able to echo that uh, sentiment that there are so many different paths that students take and there's not just one um, route that you have to go and when you are looking at your degree as well um, students often pair their degree with something else so maybe you're interested in psychology and health sciences. That's a pairing that many students do and it's a, a great way to pair some knowledge that will be really helpful in a future graduate program or degree. So there's many different ways to build that puzzle of your degree and, and we help you out with that in academic advising as well. And then looking at careers in health. So um, some students have gone on to the World Health Organization, Community Care Access Center, public health units, hospital administration, medicine and dentistry um, is a popular one, therapeutic recreation, child and youth services, occupational health and safety, education and healthcare law. So again, so many different ways that students can go. Um, it is unique to you and your degree is your specific journey. And we're here to help you make sure that you are on that um, path and, and help you with any questions that you have along the way and make sure that you are set up um, to pursue what it is that you are interested in. Thank you so much again. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to the presentation that I had to offer. And hopefully throughout that uh, presentation, again, you got an idea of the interdisciplinary approach um, within health sciences and hopefully that excites you and again I do encourage you go check out some of the the different courses that are offered read those course descriptions and I think that'll really help you to determine um, if this is something that you are interested in and hopefully I'll see you at summer academic orientation um, in the summer and I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentation. Thank you so much, Lauren. That was a wonderful overview of uh, health sciences here at Western. Uh, I'd now like to welcome on uh, Dr. Marnie Wedlake for a mini lecture on resilience and the creation of well-being. Hi, folks. I'm going to do my share screen here. You'd think after two years I'd be really good at that, but I'm not, so let's hope it works out. Okay, can everybody see my screen? We're good? Looks great. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, listen, welcome. I am super excited to be here to be joining you. Uh, the only thing that would make it better is if we were in person, but I got to tell you, I love teaching and I love teaching at Western. So I was really excited to have this chance to, to uh, be here this evening. So this is a little bit of a mini uh, version of some of the stuff that I teach in uh, two of the courses I teach at Western. And I hope it's of interest to you. Resilience and the creation of well being. 
There we go. Okay, so at the beginning of all my classes, I always do a little bit of a, an intro where I tell a little bit about myself and we tell that about each other. In this case, it's only be one sided. You'll hear a little bit about me. So, so I'm Dr. Marty Wedlake and I uh, have an undergrad degree in psychology and a master's in psychology. I have a PhD in health professional education. Um, as well, I'm a registered psychotherapist with the College of Registered Psychotherapists of Ontario, and I maintain an active clinical practice. It's part time, but uh, it's it's really quite useful. I bring a lot of, uh, of what I would call case examples into my teaching, and so I, I I feel pretty good about that part of my uh, what what I bring to my teaching. Um, academia is a second career for me. You can kind of tell by my hair I'm not a spring chicken, but I had an entire other career. We'll just say more than twenty in uh, community based mental health settings. So I bring a lot of that. Oops, I'm going automatically. I bring a lot of that into my uh, into my teaching as well. And then as of December first, I've been a full time assistant prof here at Western. Uh, teaching primarily mental health and wellness. Okay, so well-being, what is it? What does it mean? How might you define it? Who defines it? And is it the same as or different than quality of life? So these are questions we explore. These are questions we talk about in the classroom. And I got to tell you, asking these questions is a little bit like saying, what does the world smell like? They're really big questions. And they don't necessarily have easy answers, but we do our best to try and take a look at them. One of my favorite definitions of well being comes from uh, Dodge Daily and Friends, this is an article we cover in a couple of the courses that I teach. In essence, stable well being is when individuals have, have the psychological, social, and physical resources they need to meet a particular psychological, social, and/or physical challenge. When individuals have more challenges than resources, the seesaw dips along with their well being and vice versa. I'm sure, most people can relate to that. Okay, resilience. I am sure most of you have heard this word probably three, four, five, six, seven times a week these days because it's a buzzword. You bet it is. But here's the thing about buzzwords that's not a bad thing. Buzzwords become buzzwords when they're really relevant, when they're a priority, when they're really on the radar screen. So the fact that res resilience is a buzzword is actually a good thing. It means it's something that we're all excited about, we're all paying attention to, we're all thinking about. So why should I make this a priority? Why is it relevant in my life? Well, glad you asked. Higher levels of resilience, we know, are positively correlated with better outcomes overall, and certainly in school and at work. Now, defining resilience is a little bit like defining well-being. Pretty tough to do, but we give it a go, right? Okay, so I like to start with dictionary definitions for almost anything. So we've got a little dictionary definition in the sort of bottom left-hand corner here. Kind of simple definition of, of resilient is to become strong, healthy, or successful when bad things happen, right? To return to your original shape after you've been pulled or stretched or bent, right? So from some of our scholarly works that we cover in our courses, Resilience is about being persistent in the face of challenges, right? It's about perseverance and passion for long-term goals. And again, resilience is positively correlated with academic achievement. These are all good things. Okay, something to note about resilience. It is a psychosocial construct, right? So this is a, it's a thing, it is, uh, it's impinged upon, it is enabled by, it is influenced by our psychological cells and how our psychological cells kind of come up against, interact with, are shaped by what's going on in the social environment around us, right? So uh, within this is the, this notion of our adaptive characteristics, right? These are part of our individual self, right? These are the things that are within us that we might draw on either consciously or unconsciously sometimes. And we use these to cope, uh, cope with challenges or recover from challenges, traumas, adversities, or whatnot. These tend to be innate within us. So here's something that's really important about resilience is for the most part, it is an innate capacity within all people, right? It's not something that is uh, something special that you get when you're six, you know, you get you know, you start to get adult teeth when you're six or seven, you get resilience. No, nope. resilience is innate within all of us, right? Is this the psych psychosocial construct? So it is shaped a lot by what goes on within us and outside of us. And then there's this interesting that dance that goes on. So the stuff that's going on inside of us 
and the stuff that's going on around us, they come up against each other on a regular basis. And that shaping happens at kind of a macro level, right? Is it gets to be a more complex shaping that goes on. So we really want to keep that in mind when we're looking at certainly our own uh, relationship with resilience, but when we're studying it from a theoretical, theoretical perspective, we want to look at this notion of the psychosocial aspects that come together, uh, either in collusion or, or uh, a collision sometimes, and that enable or sometimes discourage the capacity to access our own resilience. So hopefully by now you're starting to see that resilience and well-being, they do go hand in hand. Okay, now we would be remiss if we did not talk about the less than exciting part, the less than positive part of resilience. And, you know, resilience is, is it is innate within all of us, right? It is something that we all have. And in an ideal world, um, all people would be able to access that resilience, right? We would all be able to uh, uh, call on our innate resilience, call on that ability to create well-being and use that to strive for, to, uh, to reach our best selves, right? But for a lot of people, this is not the case. Okay. Uh, sometimes and too often, and certainly many of us can relate to this more than we could maybe a couple of years ago, there are forces that come at us. And this is where that, that, that idea of what's going on internally, there are sort of psychological selves come up against what's going on around us, where the forces might undermine or overwhelm uh, our ability to access that innate resilience that is, is within all of us, right? And if that happens, if we can't call on our, our innate resilient cells, then you can kind of see how that's going to get in the way of us creating and maintaining and working, cultivating that sense of overall well-being, right? And so, so there's a whole pile of different forces that can, that can uh, be at work here. Uh, racism, oppression, marginalization, you know, multiple layers of marginalization. There can be exclusion in its various forms, uh, systemic disempowerment. There's a slide going again. A uh, trauma, intergenerational trauma poverty, uh, layered adversities, uh, inequality and inequity and injustice. These things and certainly combinations of these things can come together to really get in the way of us accessing that, uh, that innate resilience. So the point where it can all but snuff, us, snuff it out in some individuals and in some groups, right? Important to talk about that. Okay, so being resilient. Being resilient means being nimble, right? We gotta be on our game. We gotta be ready to kind of go with things. We've gotta be ready to meet challenges. Uh, we have to be ready uh, emotionally and cognitively, you know, in our feelings and in our mindset. Uh, we want to be finding and creating meaning, right? We don't be sitting there waiting for the world to come to us. The person who's resilient is the person who goes out there and creates opportunities. They create well-being. They go out there and look for and cultivate things. It's a very active process, right? So we are working intentionally to create positive uh, outcomes. We are working intentionally to learn from mistakes we might make or adversity that might uh, come our way, right? And we are, when necessary, we're acknowledging uh, any negative and or painful consequences that, that come along, okay? So hopefully in here, what you can see is this is a very active process. Being resilient means getting up off the couch, getting involved and meeting life head on, even when the wind is at our face and we are having to meet some tough challenges. Being resilient means getting out there and doing and being ready to create what we want to have in our lives, right? So you can see on my little diagram that I've got here on the left, a lot of us think there's a fairly straightforward way to get to success. I'm either gonna win or I'm not. It is not that way at all. The resilient person is the nimble person and they're the ones who they bebop along and no matter what comes their way, they keep bouncing back up and they keep going forward and they learn along the way to bring those new skills into what they're doing, right? That's the resilient individual. Characteristics of resilient people. Okay, so this is a, by no means is this a comprehensive list. This is just a few of the, uh, the top picks, right? Uh, this is the person who is emotionally intelligent, right? They're tuning in. They're tuning into what's going on within them, what's going on within the people around them, and what's going on in that dialogue, right? What's happening with me? What's happening to the people around me? And how are we in, engaging with each other? We're tuning in and we're trying to get a sense, right? That astute sense of, of where am I in relation to all these folks around me? 
we're trying to set realistic expectations, right? We want to have that bar raised pretty high, but we also want to be realistic as well, right? We want to reach, but we want to also be able to have successes, right? So we want to have realistic expectations. Um, we got to have a support network. Going it alone is almost never going to work out for anybody, right? So we want to have a support network, whether that's a professional support network or personal support network. You might have your favorite pets. You might have your favorite plants. You might have your, I don't know, your favorite rock collection. I mean, there's all kinds of ways we can kind of talk about support network. But the bottom line is we want to have uh, things and individuals around us that we can call on uh, when the chips are down and when we're feeling uh, like we need to have someone help us rally ourselves back into that standing position, right? We want to be nimble. We want to be flexible. We want to be able to bend and flex. We want to be able to swerve out of the way when something is coming at us. We want to be able to meet challenges head on. We want to be able to bounce back up when something knocks us over, right? We want to be able to learn, bounce back up and keep going. This is about being flexible. Where we have expectations, we want to be able to say, okay, I had an expectation. Things got a little bit different. I've got to be able to shift and change my expectation on the fly. That's being nimble. That's being flexible. That's part of being resilient. Um, we want to see challenges as opportunities. We want to have that growth mindset. Now, I'm always careful when I talk about this, right? Because I know, you know, having worked for so many years in mental health care, I know that there are times when challenges come along, when they knock someone to their knees or lower, and that person feels that they cannot get back up. Nothing wrong with that. That's okay. That's when we bring our supports in to help us kind of pull ourselves back up. Or the resilient person who's kind of tuned into themselves might say, you know what, I need to stay down for a bit here. I need to kind of collect myself and then I'm going to commit to bouncing back up again. But eventually you want to say, what did I take from that challenge? What did I learn from it? What can I pull out of that challenge, add to my toolbox and use it going forward? Because sure as heck, the next challenge is going to come along. They want to keep adding to that toolbox, right? Self-care, another buzzword, another popular word absolutely essential, right? Self-care might be everything from uh, my self-care, I got to tell you quite honestly, Friday night potato chips and my favorite online games, that's self-care, right? That's for me. Otherwise, treadmill, at least half an hour every morning, that's self-care as well. And trying to eat as many veggies as I can through the week, that's self-care as well, right? We've got to understand the importance of self-care. Think of it like this, right? You're going to drive. You're going to drive from London to Toronto. For those of you who are not from this area, it's about a two hour drive, roughly, right? Now, if you've got at the start, you've got maybe you got a quarter of a tank of gas, or maybe you got an eighth, or you're kind of on the red line in your gas tank, and you say, I, I don't feel like stopping for gas. I just want to keep going. Well, here's the deal. Probably by the time you get halfway or maybe less than that, you're going to sputter to the stop over to the side of the road because you don't have any, any gas in your tank. Self-care is about refueling, tuning into yourself, knowing when, okay, I'm, I'm sputtering here. I need to take a break. I need to pull aside. I need to do something and refuel and self-care, right? This means pacing yourself. This means tuning in and knowing, am I a sprinter? Am I a marathoner? What do I need in order to have the best chance of being my best self as often as possible? And that means tuning in and understanding the importance of self-care as it is to you as an individual. Where would we be without humor, right? Uh, sometimes when all we want to do is cry, maybe we want to change that for a little bit of laughter. And that's a good thing too. Uh, humor is important. We've got to be able to laugh at situations because sometimes there's just so much that's going on. You know, quite frankly, sometimes, uh, sometimes I, I know myself, sometimes I'm the joke and I don't even know it. But uh, you know what? I do try to use humor because I got to tell you, it gets me through some tough times. So these are the characteristics of resilient people. And then there's a whole lot more. Okay, so resilience matters, right? Cultivating resilience, again, here's an action word. This is not something that lands in our laps. It's not something, although it's innate, it doesn't mean that we can just sort of take it for granted, right? We have to be in the driver's seat with our own resilience. Otherwise, that innate resilience within us, I mean, we get a little bit of a chance of squandering it or not, at least the very least not being able to access it to its fullest potential, right? So how do I become resilient? Glad you asked. Okay, we're going to look at this through uh, first through this lens of uh, coping, right? So how do you cope with challenges? Because we've already said that being resilient means I'm going to meet that challenge. I'm going to meet it to the best of my building and meet it head on. I'm heading into the wind and here I am. Give it your best shot because I'm ready, right? So let's look at coping from two perspectives. We've got 
active coping skills, we got passive coping skills. I think you can kind of tell where this is going, right? So the passive ones, I'm going to avoid, right? This is, a, I don't even want to know. I'm not going to open that envelope. I'm not going to open that email. I just don't even want to say avoiding it, right? I know there's a deadline. I know I've got a project due, but I'm just going to pretend it's not there. And then all of a sudden I've got three hours before it's due. This is avoidance, right? This is not our, this is not our best strategy. And I got to tell you, it's one of the pop, most popular defense mechanisms in our human species, but that's another class. Okay. Uh, catastrophizing. Some little thing comes along and, oh no, it is awful. Oh my gosh, it is awful. Something goes from zero to 60 in no time. Before you know it, we have catastrophized, we've awfulized, and we've made something that was fairly small and manageable into a mountain that we think will never climb. That's catastrophizing, right? Low risk taking. I think I want to try it, but you know, it seems kind of big and I might fail and I might make a mistake. I want to answer that question, but I don't want to put it on my hand. I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to take a risk. Well, here's the deal. You don't step outside your comfort zone. You're missing most of what life has to offer. So low risk taking, right? Escaping. Okay, so I've got my potato chips and my, my online games on Friday nights, but that's a, a strategic opportunity for me to sort of have a little bit of downtime. Escaping all the time. I've spent four days on the couch in my bathrobe with too many crates of potato chips. That is escaping. Or all I've done is play video games all week and I've done nothing. Before you know it, all of my homework is piled on top of me. We got to have some balance. There is there is having some fun, taking a break, and then there is escaping, right? And you can tell escaping and avoidance, they're best pals, right? We are When we're avoiding, we're often escaping as well. Okay, the good stuff. The good stuff, the active coping skills. Number one, when we're feeling overwhelmed, when we're on our knees and we feel like we can't get back up again, or when we feel like we're going down to our knees and we're going down, we may not be able to get, get back up again on our own, we got to ask for help. We connect, we talk to others, we say, hey, you know what, I'm here, I need you, I need some help, I'm struggling. Best thing you can do, and you know what, it takes guts, it takes grit, it takes courage, but you'll never be sorry for asking for help. Mindfulness, another buzzword, but you know, you got to be able to tune in, right? Five minutes of meditation, follow your breath, breath in, breath out. Five minutes every morning is life-changing. Mindfulness is awesome because when you're mindful, you are tuning into who you are in relation to the world around you. And that is key to everyone's success, okay? Physical care, potato chips only on Friday. I got to tell you, here's a little, here's a little secret. Prior to the pandemic, Potato chips were once a month at a monthly games night and the pandemic started and before you know it, potato chips were every weekend. Then there were a couple times, true confessions here, when I had some potato chips through the week, feeling super guilty about that, but I have reformed my ways and I'm moving myself back to potato chips once a month. So that's pretty good. Self-care, right? In one lifetime, you get one body. If you don't take good care of it, it's going to poop out on you and it won't last for as long as you need it to. So self-care, right? It's the motherhood and apple pie stuff, right? Good eating, good sleeping, lots of exercise. These are all our best pal. Because if this body is a temple rather than a temple of doom, you got a much better chance of it going forward and being able to meet the challenges that come your way, right? Self-compassion. Most of us, it's been my experience, and as I said, I got a lot of years doing this stuff, it's been most my experience that most people try their best, they give their best when they have it to give, right? And if your best isn't good enough at the time, it's still your best. And there's all kinds of things, and boy, oh boy, do we ever know in these pandemic times that sometimes our best doesn't feel like it's good enough. We've got to be self-compassionate. We want to balance that with having expectation of ourselves. We also want to be compassionate, right? Because we've got to be our own best pal all the time. So this is our this is our, our sort of little bit of a laundry list here of some passive coping skills and some active coping skills. I think you can see that in an ideal world, most of the time we would choose those uh, active ones. Because we're all human, there's going to be times when we might choose some of the passive ones. As long as we catch ourselves, we pull ourselves back to that, uh, that active world, right? And sort of, sort of 80, 90% of those active ones, we're doing okay. In those times we fall into the passive ones, that's okay. What can we learn from that? How did I fall into that? How can I pull myself back out of that? All of this is learning experiences. Here's the other thing. 
in our human cells, in our, in our human condition, from the day we take our first breath right on through to the day we take our last breath, we are evolving and we are learning. So we want to take advantage of every moment when we can. And that means watching all of this stuff. When am I into the active? When am I into the passive? And how can I make shifts as I need to, right? Okay, a few little strategies for growing your own resilience muscle. Here we go, we've got six. And again, not a comprehensive list, but something to get us started. Face your fears instead of avoiding them, right? Remember, avoidance is one of our favorite defense mechanisms. Most of us, when we can, we'll, we'll, we'll just pull the covers over and, and, and blend ourselves to what's going on around us. Rarely does that work out, right? The reality is still there. So face your fears when you can. Uh, get a good... Uh, get a good uh, look at things. Um, try when you can to manage anxiety with mindfulness, right? Understand that the hard things are hard for a reason. Uh, we get good at being our best selves when we do hard things, right? So it's not a bad thing to reach. In fact, reaching is essential to our growth. It's essential to our evolution. It's essential to our success. And it's essential to ourselves as human beings trying to evolve in this lifetime, right? So face your fears, try not to avoid them. When you're avoiding them, try to catch yourself and ask yourself to reach higher, right? Establish that nurturing social support network, right? Find out who are your trusted folks, right? Who within your personal life, who might you have on campus? Who's your go-to person? Who do you need in your life to help you when the chips are down and you really feel like you can't do it on your own? Because very few people can go it alone. And really, we're social creatures, so we really shouldn't try to go it alone, right? Um, find and identify with a resilient role model. And you know what? It may even be someone you don't know, right? But someone you look up to, somebody say, wow, I'm really impressed with that person and what they've done. You know, I really see how they have taken something, you know, they've taken a bowl of really sour lemons and they've made some great lemonade. And I'm really impressed by that. And I want to do the same, right? So we can draw on uh, the successes of other people and use those as sources of inspiration. So try to do that. Find folks around you that you can use as your resilient role models. Can't say it enough. Attend your physical well-being, right? Body's a temple, not a temple of doom. If you let it go kind of sideways and becomes a temple of doom, hard to get it back, then it's hard to access all that other stuff, right? So uh, when we treat our bodies well with exercise, good eating, good sleeping, all that good stuff, uh, we are physically hardy, we are more resilient, we are more able, we are more able to keep up with the, uh, with the challenges that come our way. Overall, our affect, our sense of self, our self-esteem and our mood is much more uh, robust, much more hardy, and it will serve us well, especially, especially during difficult times like exams and such, right? right? That, that's uh, really important to have a good, strong physical self. Uh, again, self-care, right? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe spas, maybe bubble baths, maybe boring self-care, uh, but it may be uh, stuff that is good for us, right? It, it, it is essential to take time to rebuild, to refuel, to take that uh, energy that has been depleted and bring it back to a level we can draw on it again, right? Identify, utilize, and foster your character strengths, right? And this means watching for those ones that you wanna grow, right? So this is being aware of your individual strengths. This is about taking that strengths-based approach. And this is about using those to cultivate your better self, to cultivate your way to those well-being outcomes that you want to have in your life, right? This is about understanding that your success is in your power to create, right? So we really want to approach all this stuff, our notion of well-being, our notion of, of uh, resilience as active. And we are the we are the people that make it active, right? And we make it active by owning it and by owning it with intention, right? So we want to identify, we want to utilize, and we want to foster the strengths that we have within our own character that enable our resilience, that enable our well being, okay? Thank you so much for coming and for listening. And I don't know if there's any questions. I can't see the chat, but uh, Bryce will let me know if there are. Thank you so much, Dr. Redlake. That was fantastic. Um, I myself learned a lot about resilience, so I, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, walk us through that and give us uh, a little inclination as to what um, attending one of your, your first year classes might be like. 
appreciate you having me. The only thing that'd be different, if you see me in a classroom, you get a little seasick because those who have been in classes with me know I usually show up in running shoes and I do a lot of walking because that's my generator that keeps me going. So that's the only big difference. There we go. And that's, that's self-care too, getting active and uh, getting those steps in. So thank you, thank you very much. And um, we appreciate your time. And I'm sure if any questions uh, come in, we can always uh, bring those up at the end as well. All righty. So now that you've had a chance to learn a little bit more about um, well-being and resilience, uh, we'd like to turn the tables back over to you. So I'll have my co-host Ryan uh, launch our third poll of the evening. Uh, we'd just like to know what are you most looking forward to when you start here at Western? Could be your program and choosing courses. Uh, we got a lot of folks saying meeting new people and many of you saying all of the above. Yes, maybe moving away from home if you're uh, not here in London or trying something new. Wonderful. Uh, next question, a bit of a quiz for you here. Uh, we'd like to know who went to Western? So which of these celebrities, we have Marvel superhero Simu Liu, Canada's first female astronaut, Roberta Bondar, blogger and TV star Lainey Liu, or DJ duo Loud Luxury. All right, I, I probably should have put in all of the above here because all of those folks are proud Western alums. And last but not least, uh, our final poll of the evening before we get to our student panel, We'd just like to know if you've decided whether or not you'll be joining us here at Western in the fall. Got some folks saying, yes, can't wait. A few other folks saying they're still thinking about it. It's not official. And maybe some folks still waiting or making their decision, which is A-OK. Uh, there are still offer rounds to go out. So if you haven't heard from us yes, yet, hopefully you'll hear from us very soon. So thank you so much for participating in those polls this evening. Uh, and now I would like to welcome some current health study students onto the screen for our student panel. All righty, welcome everyone. Thanks again for joining us this evening. Uh, I guess we'll start off uh, with some introductions. So uh, if we can uh, just have you introduce, let us know your name, what you're studying, what year you're in, and maybe where you're from. For sure, I could start it off. My name is Matthew Pereira. I'm a current fourth year health studies student pursuing an honor specialization, and I'm from the GTA. Thank you very much, Matthew. Hey everyone, I'm Vivek. I am a current fourth year health studies student as well, pursuing an honor specialization in health studies, and I'm originally from Vancouver. Thank you very much, Vivek. Hi, my name is Elena, and I'm only a first-year health sciences student, and I'm also from the GTA. Thank you, Elena. Hey guys, my name is Hamza. I'm a second-year student in health side with bio, and I'm also from the GTA. Thank you very much, Hamza. So we have some folks here from the GTA, uh, Vivek coming all the way over um, from British Columbia. So thank you all for being here, and it's great to see we have... Um, uh, year one, year two, and some year four students here as well. So uh, definitely a well-rounded group. So thank you again for joining us. Um, first question of the night, uh, I'd just like to know, is there a favorite class you've had so far at Western? Maybe uh, a class or a professor that's maybe uh, stuck with you or a class that you'd recommend to um, our incoming students? Yeah, we'll go uh, Vivek and Matthew. Yeah, I'll start off. Um, I think what comes to mind for me is a class that I actually took this past year called Women in Health, uh, and it's taught by Dr. Jessica Polzer. It's a second year class, uh, so not that far off for some of you. Um, and it's, it's really uh, just great because you get to take a, uh, a feminist lens uh, and look at health through a feminist lens, which is, um, you know, not always done in, in other classes. And so I think it's really important and I've learned so much. Thank you very much. We'll pass it off to Matthew. For sure. Uh, a course that really um, stuck with me was taught by Dr. De Silva. It was a special topics course that is offered in third year. It's called a Special Topics Intellectual Empathy. And within this course, it was 
a very special course because it taught us one to uh, self-reflect on our own unconscious biases, um, where we come from and the perspective that we bring into healthcare and just towards our lives. And moving forward, how we can be better health advocates with this newfound knowledge and how to truly advocate for those um, in vulnerable populations, but also those who uh, may need empowerment to get uh, their voices listened to. And so it's really interesting. It's something that has helped me go on throughout my university experience and has also helped me um, in professional um, uh, essays and just also applications for future uh, careers. So that's a course that really stuck with me. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, so a couple courses to keep uh, on the lookout for for our, our incoming students, thank you. Uh, next question, uh, just like to know what uh, are some of the ways that you've been involved on campus? Maybe that's through clubs, uh, sports, jobs, uh, maybe you've done an internship or something like that, uh, any experiential learning. So if you don't mind shedding some light on some of your experiences. And we'll go Elena uh, and then Matthew. And I think I may have seen Hamza's hand up there. So uh, Elena, if you want to start us off. Yeah, for sure. So I know it can be really scary going into first year joining clubs. Like you feel like you don't really know much or you don't know how to be a good member of the team. But um, one of the uh, like faculty softs in health science told me about like uh, the Health Studies Students Association. And so I applied and it's a very great club at Western. I think if you're in first year, you should definitely join. But a lot of the older students really just take you under their wing and really teach you how to be a member of the club and how to communicate with professors, students and work towards different events. And that just really helps Western's community and Western really focuses on that student connection. So I think it's really great if you join a club like that. I've really enjoyed it so far and we'll be doing that for the next few years, hopefully. Wonderful, thank you so much. Awesome, uh, similar to Elena, uh, one thing that I uh, really want to do when I came here to Western was to continue to pursue some of my passions. And one of them was student governance. So starting in first year, I became part of my residence council. And that really helped me to understand how governance works at the university level and how we can use our voices as students to really uh, make an impact on not only our residents, but also in the Western um, community. And so moving forward, I as well joined the Health Studies Students Association, which is sort of like the uh, student council of our program. And that was very beneficial to me. I worked my way up to be president this um, past year. Uh, one of my other passions was also uh, being a mentor and helping students and peers with their learning. And so I joined the leadership and academic mentorship program where I was a mentor. And um, aside from clubs and extracurriculars, some of the job opportunities I was able to obtain through the health studies program um, and Western was a lot of research opportunities that has helped me with uh, applications to graduate schools as well as uh, jobs in the healthcare industry. That is something that I uh, really enjoyed and that I spent some of my summers previously doing. So that's a little bit about how I became involved here at Western. Thank you very much, Matthew. It sounds like you've been very busy and uh, I do know uh, student governance is, is very popular um, and a lot, a lot of students are involved in that here at Western. So thanks for sharing a little bit about that. And uh, Hamza, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, it's um, the thing that I like about Western is whatever you're into, there's probably going to be a club for it. So what I did when I wanted to choose my clubs is I first made a list of the things that I'm interested in. And then I went into, on the USC website and I just put in like a keyword. So for me, I found a cultural club in the Arab Student Association. I'm into soccer. So there's the Western Soccer Association and there's intramurals as well. And I wanted to do some volunteering. And I found this great club. It's called Learning It Together where you get to mentor kids in grades one to three in underserved communities in London. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, there, uh, we often say that if you're interested in something, chances are there's a club here at Western for you. Uh, so very glad that you're able to find a few clubs that uh, align with your passions. Wonderful, and uh, Vivek, is there anything you'd like to, to add on there? 
Yeah, I'll just add that I am also involved in student government. Um, I'm also a member of the uh, Health Studies Student Association as the VP Academics this past year, and I've been involved with other student governments uh, in my past years, and it's been uh, a very rewarding experience. So we definitely recommend uh, doing that. And um, other than that, uh, this past year, I've also had the privilege of serving as um, the anti-racism task force uh, coach, student co-chair for the Faculty of Health Sciences. And that's been a really eye-opening experience to see, um, you know, uh, the actions that we can take um, tangi tangibly at the educational level uh, to, to enact anti-racist policies and, and practices. Thank you very much for sharing. And that, yeah, that must be so exciting to see uh, that work come to fruition and, and making that tangible change uh, within your faculty and, and the school as a whole. So thank you all for sharing um, a little bit about your extracurricular um, experiences at Western. Uh, we do have a question that uh, came in uh, just asking about um, if any of you had the chance to stay in residence, uh, maybe which residence you stayed at um, and what your experience was like there. Elena, do you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. So I'm actually in residence right now and I'm in Essex Hall, which is a pretty quiet residence, but I really enjoy it. Like I'm friends with all my roommates. We all kind of like it because it's more quiet if you're really like just want to go back home and study like we have a good calf and we just have a great like kitchen so you can always cook at home and nice space so it's really great awesome thank you we'll pass it over to Vivek yeah so I was in residence in first year um, I was in Medway Sydenham Hall which is one of the uh, traditional style residences here at Western uh, and I loved it there because um, it's really easy to make friends with everyone on your floor uh, everyone's so close to each other um, it's really inevitable that you're going to become super close with your floor. And so that was great coming from far away from across the country and not knowing very many people here. Uh, it was it was really easy to make friends that way. Thank you. And we'll pass it off to Matthew. Yeah, Jill, just to echo off what Elena and Vivek said, um, I was in residence as well. I was in a hybrid style Perth Hall. Um, I really enjoyed it as well. It was a great opportunity to meet uh, new people. I came similar to Vivek without knowing a lot of people here at Western and just coming into residence and seeing how open everyone was and making friends with everyone on your floor was so great. Um, one thing that I noticed that is uh, great about residence is that everyone's so open to meeting new people. A lot of people just keep their doors open and are just waiting for people to come by and just say hi. And that was something that I really enjoyed about residence. Thank you very much. Yeah, getting to meet new people, especially if you're coming from out of town or maybe you don't know a lot of folks that are uh, attending Western as well, that, that's definitely one of the benefits. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, all right, bit of a, a, a lighter question, um, just a quick hitter, but we'd love to know uh, if you have a favorite study spot on campus as well as a favorite place to eat. So we'll start off with uh, Hamza. Um, so my favorite study spot is the one that I'm actually in right now. It's the engineering building. Um, I don't know if you'd be able to see it, but you've got like an open concept with all of the windows here. You've got leather chairs upstairs and a coffee vending machine. And um, my favorite place to eat is definitely the Spoke. The bagels are actually something that you don't find anywhere else. Yes, yeah, Spoke is a, is a popular option. Uh, I'd be lying if I said I, I wasn't a regular customer there. So... I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, Vivek? Yeah, this is actually a tough question because I find myself constantly finding new study spots on campus that, you know, that I love. Um, I have to say this year, I studied at the Ivy Building for the first time, which is a beautiful brand new building. I think you can actually see it in the background there of Hamza's uh, um, screen. And, and yeah, so that's, that's definitely my favorite for this year. And in terms of places to eat, um, we have a, um, a restaurant called The Wave uh, in the upstairs of the University uh, Community Center. And um, yeah, that's, that's my favorite by far. Thank you. Yes, uh, a lot of folks mentioned the spoke and The Wave is, is on the, the second floor. And uh, yeah, those two very, very popular, uh, great spots to stop. Uh, Matthew. So a spot that I've currently uh, really enjoyed is the new study spaces here in the Health Sciences Building. 
Um, I'm currently in it. As you can tell, I really like <laughs> using a whiteboard. So these are kind of like the isolated rooms uh, where it's really great for group studying as well as, you know, maybe between classes coming here and reviewing some concepts. So this is currently one of the spots that I find really beneficial for health study students. Um, and in terms of favorite uh, eatery places here at Western, I have to echo uh, with some of the other students outside, which is the spoke. My go-to order is the jalapeno cheddar um, BLT that the spoke does. So that's just a little bit about what I like. Very, very nice. And uh, also nice, we're, we're getting a little bit of a tour of these, these spaces as well. So that's, that's even better. Um, Elena. Yeah, so my favorite study spot is the new one at Thames Hall, and it's like a beautiful plant wall. So while you're studying, you have a lot of greenery, big windows, you can study with your friends or alone. And my favorite spot to eat is the spoke because you can get a coffee, a bagel and just go and study and you're good. Wonderful. Yes. Uh, yeah. The re recently renovated uh, Thames Hall. I was just there for a, a little bit of a tour the other day and that uh, that green wall does does make a huge difference. A lot of natural light coming in there, too, which is is nice when you're you're deep in, in study mode. So um, final two questions of the night. Um, first off, uh, what made you choose Western? You may have been uh, considering a couple of schools to go to. Uh, and what was it about Western that made you decide uh, to come here? We'll start off with Vivek. Yeah, this was a, this is a great question. And I think for me, it was a particularly tough decision to move so far away from home. Uh, but what swayed me was, was kind of two things. So Firstly, I knew that Western is renowned for its student experience, and I, I really wanted a university experience. Uh, and so, yeah, um, that, that was the main reason that I came. And then secondly, um, and, and maybe this was, you know, the, the, the primary reason for my, for my decision was the health studies program and just how unique of a program it is. Um, when I was doing research on programs, I really couldn't find another program that was, that was like it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's turned out to be everything that I wanted it to be. So. Awesome. Thank you, Vivek. We're glad you, uh, you made the trek over here to, to London, Ontario, and we're glad that you uh, have enjoyed your time in, in health studies. Uh, Elena. Yeah, for sure. So in grade 12, I remember looking at so many programs, like every day after school, I'd look through like Queens, McMaster and Western. I'd always be looking through life science or medical science. And at Western, I was originally looking at medical science. And when I found out about kind of like the whole health side program, I was like, wow, this is such a like perfect fit. I didn't even know a program could fit so many students so perfectly. I find that health side helps me apply so many health concepts to everyday life, to my friends, my family. And I think that if you're really um, into health that you'd enjoy it at Western and Western students really study super hard, but also enjoy like their life and still socialize and have fun. So I think for the balance at Western too, like perfect academics, perfect social time. So I think it would be perfect for any grade 12 students that are considering it. I've really enjoyed my time here just in first year. Thank you, Elena. Yeah, that uh, what you mentioned there about the applicability of, of health studies, uh, I think echoes what uh, Dr. Uh, Wedlake was um, lecturing on earlier, right? The uh, resilience and well being. that's something we can take uh, even from our presentation tonight and apply all directly uh, into our lives. So thank you very much. Um, and we'll, we'll move on to our uh, final, or sorry, uh, I should open the floor. Uh, Matthew, Hemza, did you have anything to add there? Um, yeah, the, so for me, the deal breaker or kind of the thing that made, set the difference, because um, for me, I, I saw a lot of similarities. There's a lot of great outside programs you can find, um, life science programs. But the reason the thing that distinguished Western for me was that, um, Western really the pride itself and how much they take care of teaching and engaging students, not just presenting the content, but actually engaging the students. So you make the classes more interactive. Um, and that way it just helped the students learn a lot quicker, um, which for me mattered a lot. I wanted to be engaged in class, not just presenting content in a mundane way. Awesome, thank you, Hamza. And uh, I definitely got that vibe as we were watching uh, Dr. Woodlake's presentation there as well engaging and uh, uh, being absorbed within the content instead of just being uh, kind of uh, lectured to. So thank you uh, very much. Uh, Matthew, anything you'd like to add there? 
Um, most of what I'm going to say, uh, Vivek, Elena, and Hamza did a great job of um, articulating. But essentially for me, it was the health studies program is very unique. I was also debating if I should go into medical sciences or health sciences programs in other universities. And when I took a deeper dive into what I truly wanted, uh, I wanted a program that could provide me a perspective on health that was more holistic. It was something that not only included the, you know, the hard sciences of bio and chemistry, but also electives and courses that would teach me how to look at health through a patient's perspective, how I could integrate those concepts of a advocate for the health of a patient to articulate what it means to create better equitable policies in the future and how to truly be a leader in the uh, for future healthcare um, is something that I really prioritized. And I noticed that the health sciences program catered to that very well. And I can say going through my four years here, it has definitely been the case. I've been able to uh, really grasp the perspective of the holistic medicine and is something that um, I will carry in uh, my future uh, goals and professional development. Thank you, Matthew. Yes, uh, Lauren mentioned that in, uh, in her program overview at the beginning there, that holistic and well-rounded approach to health, which is, is so, so important. So uh, I'm glad uh, that you all chose to, to study here at Western. And, and of course, uh, thank you again for helping out this evening. Um, last question uh, to end the night off on before we answer a couple of questions live. Um, there may be some attendees that are making that transition from high school uh, to university. Um, do you have any advice for making that transition or maybe something you wish you could have told yourself back when you were making that transition? Uh, Hemza, do you want to get us started? Um, yeah, I think the two things that I realized that were critical to my development as a university student was A, having a schedule is so detrimental. Just from the first day of classes, they're gonna give you the syllabus with the date of each quiz, each exam. Put those all on a schedule and you won't miss an exam. Um, and then the second thing is that to be successful in your classes, um, it, it's about the little things that you do every single day. It's not gonna be about how much are you able to cram in in that month for exam period. It's about what you do every single day, day in and day out, so that it becomes routine and you do it on a weekly basis. And when things become routine, it doesn't feel as exhausting anymore. You'll realize in the first week, it may feel exhausting to study the certain course, but once you get into a routine, it becomes a lot easier. Excellent advice there. Yeah, staying organized, whether that's uh, in a calendar for yourself, getting all those assignments and quizzes and exam dates down. And then like you said, kind of chunking that studying so you're not trying to cram all at once uh, can make it a lot more manageable. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, off to Elena. Yeah, for sure. So I know in high school, like older university students always tell you like your grades are going to drop, your grades are going to drop. And in university, when that does happen, you get a bad grade. Um, just as Dr. Wedlake mentioned about resilience, it matters more how you handle that and like your core values, core traits to um, kind of bounce back from that and see what you can do to improve. So don't just focus on, oh, getting a bad grade or I'm just defined by my grades, but making sure that you have the resilience and the perseverance to improve those grades, work hard and reach out for help. But it's really important to just not let that define you and just make sure to keep working hard and just don't let it uh, get to you. Just be resilient and work hard because Western and the Western like staff members always want to help you. Same with professors, teachers, uh, teaching assistants. So always reach out for help and don't be afraid to ask even older students for help. Definitely. Yes. And there, there we go again with that applicability. What you're learning in your courses can uh, be applied directly to, to your life. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing that. Elena, uh, we'll pass it off to Matthew. Great points said by Hamza and Elena. Um, and just to echo a couple more, I think one thing that I was really nervous about when going from the transition from grade 12 to first year university was that in high school, um, you're in a more closed knit environment. You know most of your classmates, you've been with them for four years and it's a lot less people. And one of my worries was that coming to university uh, in a, such a bigger scale where there are so many more students, so many different programs and the campus is 
huge. How am I going to, you know, uh, integrate myself in this new community? And one thing that I noticed going through these four years was that it is still such a closed knit community. There's so many people here in the health studies program that I've grown to be so close with. And it really does feel like a family here. It feels like a community that we've been able to build and really uh, learn from one another. And that leads me to the second thing that um, I uh, wish that someone would tell me in that half the learning that happens here in university is not from just lectures, but it's from collaboration from peers, from students who are younger, older, who are different from you. And the reason why you come to university isn't just because of the world-renowned learning that we get from Western University, but it's also because we are exposed to so many different individuals from multiple perspectives. And it's important to embrace one another, to learn from one another. And that's something that I was so happy to be able to do here in the health sciences program because we focus a lot on collaboration. And so right from the get-go coming from uh, and being placed in residency where we have people such as Vivek who comes from BC, somewhere I've never been before and having conversations about different places everyone comes from and learning from them was truly uh, an amazing opportunity. It changed the way I looked at things and um, was half the learning that I experienced here at uh, Western University. Thank you so much. Some very, very wise words there. And uh, yeah, keeping an open mind and, and learning from uh, not just your professors, like you said, but uh, your classmates and your peers and those around you. So excellent. Uh, we'll pass it off to Vivek. And then I see uh, Hemza hand there, uh, he can uh, finish off the night for us. Yeah, I have to agree with everything that, that Matthew just said. Um, it's so important to, to be open to meeting other people, learning about other people. Um, and, you know, something that, that I think held me back a bit at the beginning was just being afraid to, to get out there and get involved. Uh, and so advice that I'd give to myself if I was starting over again uh, is just to, just to do it, you know. There's 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 no better way uh, to to meet people uh, and to expand your community and your experiences than getting involved on campus. Uh, there's you know as we as we talked about earlier, there's so many opportunities, uh, and people here are really there to help you. Um, and so yeah, that that would be my advice. Thank you kindly, and uh, off to Hamza. And um, sorry, I think I just forgot my hand, hand up. Oh, no, no worries at all. Uh, thank you all for sharing uh, those uh, tidbits of advice for our uh, incoming students. I think they're very helpful. I would have loved to have heard those words uh, before making my transition uh, to university. So thank you again for uh, carving some, times out, uh, some time out of your schedules uh, to be with us this evening. Best of luck if you're uh, finishing up any exams. Uh, I know it's a very, very busy time. So good luck on those finals. And uh, thank you again for being with us tonight. But just uh, in regards to maybe postgraduate studies from health, uh, from health studies, um, I know a lot of folks might be interested in uh, medical school, for example. So uh, is there a specific program students have to take uh, or prerequisites to be eligible for that? And then maybe what are some of the other avenues students might take um, after studying undergraduate, uh, their undergraduate degree in health studies. I can help to answer that one. Um, so a lot of students do ask that question of, you know, can I get a Bachelor of Health Science? Am I able to go to medical school afterwards? And the answer is yes. Um, we, we try to echo that as much as possible, that there isn't one specific route that you need to take if you are looking at medical school. A lot of the medical schools don't have specific prerequisites. So it's more about taking something that you're interested in because that's where you're going to do well. If you're taking courses that you're interested in, a program that you're interested in, that is where you're going to excel. So that's what we encourage you to do is really seek out a program that most interests you. And then as well, when you are looking at any of those postgraduate programs, taking a look at what their requirements are um, so that you can prepare yourself for something like the MCAT or whatever may be involved in that. And we can always help you with that in academic advising to make sure that you are prepared for those requirements that you would need when you are applying for graduate programs. 
And then that goes along the same lines as if you are looking at anything outside of um, medicine as well, maybe students are looking at dentistry. Um, so for that, wanting to make sure that you get in the prerequisites while you're in um, your undergraduate program, but there's not typically a specific program that you have to take. It's more so getting specific prerequisites for the graduate program that you're interested in. Hopefully that helps to answer that a little bit. Yes, thank you so much, Lauren. I, I appreciate you walking us through that answer. Um, I see a couple here that, that I can take care of. So uh, one other admission offer round. So for our uh, 101 applicants that are currently studying at an Ontario high school student, uh, there will be another uh, offer round heading out in May. So if you haven't heard from, it, from us just yet, uh, keep working hard in school, keep doing your best. Um, the majority of our applicants uh, from Ontario do hear in April and May. Um, so you should hear from us soon. I know it's very difficult to wait, but hang in there and uh, our fingers are crossed for you. Uh, we've also got uh, another question here about uh, an open house for students or opportunities to come visit campus, and maybe visit uh, residents. We do have an open house event scheduled for Saturday, May 7th. Uh, so you can register for that on uh, the same website you registered for this event. Uh, you, uh, welcome.uwo.ca slash presentations. So you'll find information there, uh, some scheduling for the day, and you can kind of build your own schedule, uh, see what you want to see, explore campus, check out residents. Uh, it's a great opportunity to get on campus and see what it's like to be a student here at Western. Uh, so I'll go through a couple of the other uh, courses or questions here. Um, Right. Um, maybe some elective opportunities. Lauren, I know you had a slide on that in your presentation, but um, maybe just what are some of the elective opportunities for students within health uh, science who um, are looking to kind of dive deeper into uh, certain topics? Yes, great question. I know um, students really want to know what are the courses that you'd be able to take um, when you're in the program in terms of electives within health sciences. I went through some of those, um, but there's, you know, one of the ones that I like to mention um, is social media and health, and that's really relevant in our life today as well. So looking at those different courses um, on our website as well, we have a lot of information about the specific courses that we do offer uh, from year to year or that we've offered in the past as well. And and maybe Dr. Wedlake would be able to provide some information on even a course that you um, that you teach as well. But one thing I will mention, I know students are often looking at electives within their program, but it's also looking at electives outside of your program as well. Um, so maybe you really like psychology and you want to take courses in that uh, throughout your degree and pair that um, with your health sciences, or maybe you love Spanish and you just want to continue that at the undergraduate level as well. So it's not just looking at those courses that are going to be in your core program, but looking at those courses outside of the program as well to, to really balance your learning. So not just focusing on one specific area, but having a lot of that room within the degree. So um, to kind of branch off of that a little bit more within our modules, we have specific courses that you have to take and that can build that puzzle within your health science degree. But then there is still a lot of room for students to take something that they're interested in outside of that as well. So maybe you just love computer science and you want to pursue a minor in that. So it's taking a look at all all of those different pieces as a whole, um, but certainly within um, the health sciences program, a ton of different courses. And I would encourage you to just check out on our website, all of the different ones that might interest you um, and, and see if they kind of, you know, pique your interest. And I don't know if um, Dr. Wedlake or um, Dr. Jo Rick Forrester Jones have some specific ones that they want to mention in terms of kind of your general interest that, that you think students would love to hear about. I always love to talk about the courses I teach. Um, so there's a course, a um, couple that are, are come to mind right away. There's a third year course I teach called Media and Mental Health. And that's a really cool course because it's cross-listed with the Faculty of Information and Media Studies. And so uh, half the students are from health sciences and half are from uh, media information and techno culture. So we get some really great discussions going on because you've got uh, students coming out this course from different angles. And in that course, what we do is we do uh, a critical um, examination of the relationship of the media to mental health systems. And so it's a pretty cool course. We look at 
uh, we come at this course from so many different angles. And as I said, we get some really rousing discussions going on about uh, different aspects of the media, that what the media is as storytellers and how their how their uh, uncritical acceptance of, of dominant discourses shapes our beliefs and, and the uh, understands that we have, we go right back to uh, the, you know, the founding father of propaganda, who was actually Sigmund Freud's nephew. We look at how that has shaped uh, the perspectives we have on, uh, on mental health, broadly speaking. So that's a really cool course uh, from my perspective. Um, another course that's fairly new, that is a fourth year elective course, is uh, Trauma-Informed Care in the Health Professions. And anybody who has any interest in healthcare, whether it's from a poly policy perspective, a law perspective, going to be a physician, going to be a chiropractor, going to be a physiotherapist, uh, trauma-informed care is the gold standard in healthcare. And so we look at uh, what does it mean to practice in a trauma-informed way? What is trauma-informed care? And what does that actually look like within healthcare and within certain uh, particular realms? What might it look like for, uh, you know, in a, a, through the lens of epistemic injustice? What might it look, um, look like for refugees or new Canadians? Um, so trauma-informed care and health professions is uh, another elective that, uh, that I think is pretty cool as well. Well, I'd, I'd like to give a shout out to um, the independent study because this is where people can really... Um, specialize in the areas that have piqued their interest. So if there's a if there's a topic that you really like and that you've been learning about in your first few years, then you can really go to town and write um, a paper or a dissertation on this and you'll be matched to an, a, a faculty member and they'll guide you through it. And I think, you know, in terms of having the opportunity to do research at this level, um, as we're growing, there are going to be more opportunities for research uh, right from the get go, uh, from your first year onwards. Um, but I think that independent study, uh, I did one in my final year, I did a dissertation um, about migration, actually, and uh, I, that was something that really led me on to doing research onto my PhD. So um, that kick started me into my career, uh, because I, I was interested in doing my own research I liked independent studies so that was one of them and the others are that we're growing our experiential learning um, so we have a new practicum course coming on board this um, next academic year and uh, that's where students will be able to have um, maybe more practice orientated uh, be able to apply the knowledge that they're learning um, in the real world um, and there's also lots of opportunity for volunteering so I those are the kind of ones that I, I like and I also you know I have to be careful because I think I don't want to um, plug other courses because they're all good and I'd like to take them all as well if I could do the degree again I'd do it now with all you so yeah thank you so much yes it sounds like there are so many fantastic options and um, my fiance is actually uh, graduated from med school at Western. Uh, she's doing her residency now. And a lot of these uh, topics that are being brought up tonight, the holistic approach, social determinants of mental health, um, the, the trauma-informed healthcare, um, that, that is all uh, so, so important and uh, is something that, uh, you know, she, listening to her and her experience that, that she is seeing a lot out in the real world. So that applicability is so important. Uh, and it sounds like health studies uh, has so many opportunities for, for students and that independent study opportunity as well. Dive really deep into a topic you're passionate about uh, sounds incredible. So uh, thank you all for um, and fielding all these questions this evening and for volunteering your time. Um, I think we've cleared out our questions for the night. Uh, but if a question comes to mind later on, you can always head to uh, welcome.uwo.ca. Uh, there's many ways to connect with us on there. You'll also see the recording of this presentation on welcome.uwo.ca slash presentations. So that will be up in about a week. Um, and thank you again to all of our attendees for joining us, all of our volunteers, uh, staff, faculty, current students. We really appreciate it. And uh, good luck to you all on your journey to university. <laughs>